I, uh, this mic, can you hear me? Give me the thumbs up. <laughs> All right, good. I never know. This, I've got this allergy going on, so everything's sort of ringing anyway, so. Good to see everybody this morning. How many of you know the Lord's Prayer? What we call the Lord's Prayer? Most of us. There's a phrase in there we want to look at this morning. If if I was to ask David and say, David, are you going to go to Walmart tomorrow? Because I knew David had plans to go to Walmart tomorrow. What might be David's answer? I hate that place. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. What else would we might say? Lord willing. Yeah, a lot of folks would say Lord willing. If the Lord wills, you know, that's, and we use that phrase a lot, but what, do we actually know what that means? And do we use it correctly? Where does that come from? The Lord's Prayer, right? Thy will be done. It's part of that prayer. So this morning I want us to spend some time thinking about the Lord's will. You know, Lord willing. If the Lord will. What is that actually talking about? You know, it's a familiar statement. It's an accepted statement. People who have nothing to do with church or religion or whatever use it. Because they understand the meaning of it a little bit. It's sort of a comfortable saying. It doesn't threaten anybody when we say it. Uh, it has this connotation of some loyalty to God. So we understand he's in control and devotion to him. And we always think that God's will is good, right? We don't look at God's will and say, God's got a bad will for us. We never say that. So we understand a, a statement and we agree that when we're speaking about God's will, you know, it's talking about his wishes getting done. So if I would say, David, are you going to Walmart tomorrow? And he said, Lord willing, that means if the Lord is okay with it, if the Lord desires that to happen, if we want to do that. He wants us to do that. Uh, and as Christians, we always want to achieve his will. We always want to be familiar with it. We always want, our goal is to be what it, do what it says. So when we look at that phrase, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's right out of that model prayer, Matthew chapter 6, telling us about Christ is saying, you know, whatever God wants, that's what we should be concerned with. We need to understand it. You know, there's no mystery to it. It's a very simple thing. We understand what God wants. If we use the phrase sometimes in the, in the United States particularly, we'll say it's the will of the people. What does that mean? That's exactly right. It means the majority says it's okay. When we elect someone, the will of the people determines who gets the office. The majority rules. Well, <clears throat> a simple majority. So we understand this how this phrase is, is used in multiple uh, ways. Uh, we do not dictate to God what his will is. Now, sometimes we have folks that dictate our will, right? Why are you smiling, Roxanne? <laughs> we have people that dictate our will. You know, maybe our boss at work. Maybe our teacher at school. Maybe our spouse. Maybe some, something else. You know, that they tell us what we need to be doing. What we need to be thinking. You know, what we should be striving to do. Usually, though, when we ask for the Lord's will, we're asking for a specific blessing, something specific to happen. When we pray for the sick, what do we sometimes say? Your will be done. Whatever your will is, see, it's inappropriate. Uh, in fact, it's impossible for us to determine what or to make God's will other than something that he has made for himself. 
We can't dictate what God's will is going to be. You know, we don't want to sound arrogant and haughty and superior to God himself. So we pray submissively. God, your will be done. What you want to be done. And that's what Christ was teaching his disciples about here in Matthew chapter 6. This is a very particular, very specific prayer that he you know, uses as a model for us. And we call it the Lord's Prayer. How many of you ever watched Jeopardy? There was an episode, I think it was last year, well, there's a clip of it on YouTube, where three very smart people playing Jeopardy were asked a phrase from the Lord's Prayer, and none of them could identify where it came from. They didn't know it. But that's what God tells us, or what Christ told his disciples. Here's the way that you ought to pray. And we remember a lot of us grew up reciting the Lord's Prayer in school. I don't guess you can do that anymore. Those kinds of things. You know, we hear it sometimes at public functions. And, uh, there's even a hymn where it's been put to music in our songbook. So it's a very familiar phrase. And people don't think a whole lot about it when it's said. But in that prayer, there's something additional. And that's what I really want us to think about. We think about your will be done. But look at that next phrase. On earth as it is in heaven. Christ is describing something here for us. He's telling us God has a will that even is done in heaven. And he says it should be done on the earth exactly the same way it's done in heaven. We don't think about that part much. We don't put much emphasis on that part. Yeah. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we ever give that some serious thought, I think it's going to sort of open our eyes to some things. How is God's will done in heaven? And why isn't the way it's done in heaven the same way that it's done on earth? So first of all, we understand God has a will. When we think of the word will, what do we think of? Last will and testament. Yeah. Something that's written down that says, these are my wishes when I die. This is what I want to happen after I'm gone. But, you know, it's also, that's past tense, but it's also present tense, right? My will is what I want to happen today, what I want to happen right now. And so, when we think about it, God having it, God has things he wants done. He has things he wants to happen. And he controls that. You know, I, can, I can't always control my will. I want things. I want things to happen a certain way. I want people to do certain things. But I can't make it happen. I have no control. I don't have a means of control. But God, on the other hand, has that control. Now, he may give it up. He may put it, delegate it to someone else. He may change it, but it's still his will. God is willing that no one, what? Perish. But do people perish? So why isn't God's will done? Because God has left it up to us to determine and to follow his will. He's given us that choice. But that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a will. And so his purposes are important to him. His purposes are important that it gets accomplished. And so it should be important to us as well. And he has reasons for what he does and what he wants. You know, sometimes we just want something because we look at something and we like it and we say, well, I wish I had that. So I'm going to get it. Or I'm going to start to try to get it. Or whatever. You know, God has specific reasons for what he wants. And for what he does. So it's not just some random, God just 
wakes up one day and says, we're going to do something different. No, God has specific reasons. And so it should motivate us and it motivates him that he's moved by his purposes. That's why we're taught several places, we're going to look at a few, about his will. And the importance of us connecting to it. Well, when he says he's not willing that any should perish, that means that's what he desires. That's his purpose. That's his reason for doing everything he's done so that we do not perish. So that we aren't lost. And so it's not insignificant. And as he has these specific objectives and what he says and what he wants, the purpose and the reasons and the motives are not given to God by us. You know, we don't assign to God, God, this is what you need to do. <coughs> God, this is what you should be doing. God, this is the way you should make this work. We wonder sometimes, though, why things happen the way they happen. Why God allows it. Why God lets things happen. But God's purpose and God's reasons and God's motives come from him. Not from anything we do. We're told to pray. There's a connection there through prayer to his will. But at the bottom line is, we don't give God... We don't assign that to him. He doesn't act or function because we've decided this is the way we want it done, so God, you have to do it that way. God speaks to us. He doesn't need to be told what to think. He doesn't need to be told what to do you know, or what to want. He's not depending on us. You know, we depend on each other sometimes. We ask for help. We ask for advice. We ask for clarity. We ask for people to, to you know, <coughs> help us think through things. God doesn't work that way. He's not depending on us to decide how he thinks or how he feels. He knows what he wants, and he knows why he wants it. And what he wants and what he's, <coughs> excuse me, what he wants and what he, his purpose, he's revealed to us in his word. God said, well, I wonder what God's thinking about. I couldn't start to tell you. Other than what he's already told us. You know, what he's done. You know, some people, they, they don't have to picture God as sort of this uh, senile grandfather, you know, that's sitting up in heaven trying to get his thoughts together. And he's sort of getting old. And he's not thinking too clearly like a lot of us are getting. And, <clears throat> you know, he exists in this remote place away from everybody else. And as he does that, you know, he's sort of afflicted with this feeble mentality. <coughs> uh, God is living. God is alive. God is knows what he wants, and he knows how to think and why he thinks that way. And his will is founded on good reasons and wisdom. Has God ever revealed to us something that was bad for us? No. You know, has he ever said, I want something bad to happen to these folks? Now, he punishes us because of the, you know, the consequences of our actions sometimes. He's righteous in his judgment. But is that what he desired first and foremost? No. He always has our best interest in his mind and what he wants to happen to us. And so we lack wisdom. We're sometimes not very smart folks, right? We struggle with it sometimes. Paul over in Romans, I think it's chapter 1, says, you know, they, they claim to be wise, but what are they really? Fools. Fools. Well, it's because they try to outthink God. They try to determine what they want and then say, God, 
God, that's what you have to think as well. That's what you need to do as well. But his will, will is founded on specific reasons and specific purposes. Uh, and in every situation, his will is always superior to ours. Isaiah says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher, or my thoughts, than your thoughts. Same chapter, or a little, early, or a little later. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth, and it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent. God says, my will gets done. It doesn't return to me empty. The th whatever I want in my purpose, it gets accomplished. And it gets it, it is successful. So what does it mean for God's will to be done? You know, that's what Christ prayed for or showed us how to pray for. That it be it gets done. Well, first of all, God's intents rule over us. When we talk about his will, it's just not, well, that's what he wants. Whether he gets it or not, I don't know, don't care, can't control. No. What God wants is what God gets. And so it rules us. It controls us. We are to be obedient to it. We are to obey his will. When we talk about the sovereignty of God, that God is sovereign, what does that mean? Ruler. Ruler. He's the ruler, exactly. If we lived in a kingdom, we, the king is sometimes called the sovereign, right? Or we call it the sovereign nation. It's because that person is the ruler of that nation. We are subject to him. We're subject to God. Now, a lot of people say, no, I'm not. I get to do what I want to. I don't even know if there is a God. I don't care if there's a God. I'm not going to even worry about if there's a God. I want to do what I want to. Does that still relieve them of God's sovereignty? No. We are just fooling ourselves. There went the wisdom. We're just fooling ourselves when we think that way. And people still think that way with the... They can do what they want to, but if they get in trouble with the law, then that's... Yeah, exactly. I want to do what I want to, but I can still... You know, the sheriff still may arrest me because I broke the law. Well, there's punishment. Same way with God. You know, and his purpose is to determine the course and the direction for the people that belong to him. You know, we obey his will not out of force, but we obey his will out of love. We obey, his, we obey his will because we know who God is. And so it determines our direction. It determines our course because we belong to the sovereign king. We belong to the creator of the universe. And so his will impacts anyone who reveres him and anyone who respects him. And so we don't rebel against him. Now, if you're a parent, as your children grew, how many of your children ever disobeyed your will? At least once, right? Probably multiple times, but at least once. You said, I don't want you doing this. I don't want you to, you know, being here or doing this or staying out here. Or doing, I've got these sort of rules. And this child never, ever broke one. Doesn't work that way, does it? Our will, even though they may respect us, love us, reverence us, they still broke our will. They still did something contrary to it. They rebelled against our wishes. That's what man has done with God. 
God, not willing that all any perish, but all come to what? Repentance. No, I'm not going to repent. I'm not going to change. See, we rebel against his wishes. But on the positive side, there are those of us who have determined because of who God is and what he's done that we're going to serve him, that we are going to respect him, that we're going to try our best to serve him and his uh, wishes for us. So we seek to accomplish that. We strive every day to accomplish that. So how is God's will done in heaven? That was the prayer, right? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How's God's will determined, or how's his will done in heaven? Well, when we think of heaven and the biblical description of heaven, the impressions we get from reading about heaven, how do we picture heaven? Perfect place. Perfect place, right? Place we're all working hard to get there. Our will is to try to get to heaven. But truthfully, the scriptures don't give us uh, our, the scriptures don't give us a lot of information of exactly how heaven is going to be. We get these you know, general descriptions and stuff. Who's in heaven? If we were to say who's in heaven right now, God, what, what would we describe who's up there with, with him? God and Jesus. And we know that his son is there. Angels. Angels. Who are angels? God's created beings. Yeah, created by God. We always think of that picture, you know, we've got a, this angel on this shoulder and the devil on this shoulder kind of thing sometimes. God's servants. God's servants. Servants do what their master wants. Right? We're talking about done, his will being done. Our angels are responsible for doing his will in heaven. When we read the description over in Revelations, what does it tell us about heaven? No tears, no pain, no suffering, eternal rest, praising God. Being around the throne, the magnificence of it, describes what it's made out of to give us that mental picture of heaven. So we get the, this very specific impression of heaven and how great it is. And in heaven, God is held in absolute reverence and honor. Heavenly beings are there to desire, and whose, their only desire is to fulfill God's command. You know, and his purposes are fulfilled without question. They obey what God has told them to do. They don't question it. They don't resist it. But they that is a, the only thing. But they have a choice. They have a choice. We're getting there. Oh, okay. I won't say that. <laughs> His purposes are the only purposes. Would an angel look at God and say, you know, let me think about that and get back to you later. Would an angel look at God and say, you know, I prefer really God not to do that. Would an angel look at God and say, ah, you know, it really doesn't interest me much. You know, that's not important to me, God. An angel wouldn't react that way, would he? His son didn't react that way, did he? Those who are in heaven with him today would, would not have that attitude, would they? Well, I'm glad I'm here, God, but just leave me alone. I'm going to do what I want to up here. See, we fail, to, we fail to make that connection. God's will done on this earth exactly the same as it's done in heaven. 
That's what Christ was praying for. It's what he was telling us to pray for. That God's will in heaven is done in total submission. So how should his will be done on this earth? In total submission. His purposes should be our only purpose. We shouldn't question what he says, what his will is. And we should have this desire to fulfill his commands to the letter, exactly, because of our reverence and our honor of him, because we know of spending time with him in heaven. So we need to be thinking about on earth as it is in heaven. So what would it mean if we fulfill God's will here just like that? If mankind, human beings, fulfill God's will on earth like it is fulfilled in heaven. I don't know if you can see that, but, you know, we as human beings would hold God in the same kind of reverence that those in heaven hold him today. We would absolutely honor him the way when we get to heaven we're going to honor him. We would be trying to fulfill his wishes and his desires. And we would be trying to do that perfectly. And we wouldn't resist it. We wouldn't rebel against it. We would follow his will. And that his purposes would be our purposes and no other purpose would exist. His will would always take precedence to our will. When we think about the landscape of religion, when we think about just society in general, why is it so different than God's will? Yeah. Is it? it is, please himself. God does it to please himself. God, we think he does, but, but he doesn't. He doesn't have any selfish thought. Right. Right. You know, the reason that we set aside God's wishes is because we put our wishes ahead of his. My feelings, my purpose, what I want is more important than what God wants. So if I want to go over here and do something that's contrary to what God has said, that's okay because it's more important to me. I take priority. My will is more important than his will. It takes precedence. See, but if it's done the way it is in heaven, then God's purposes are always going to be the deciding factor. I'm always going to be striving to do what he wants, what he desires, what he's told me. And it would be done in this thought of total submission. I'm going to be submissive to God all the time. And you say, well, that can't happen. That's impossible. The world will never come to that conclusion. You know, it's not going to happen in these circumstances. Too many people will never submit to God. Is that a true statement? Straight is the gate, few there be. Wide is the way to destruction, many go in thereat. Why is many going in thereat? As they put their will ahead of God's will. What they want comes first. They're not submissive to God. You know, if we look at the rulers of the nations, if we look at rich people sometimes, if we look at powerful people and politicians and wicked people, 
They never seek any will but their own. That's true. That's true. Everyone seeks their own will. And so we ignore God's will. So it's his will is not being done on this earth as it is in heaven. When we compare the two, they don't compare. We don't surrender ourselves to God. So if the whole world doesn't agree with that and goes their own way, does that mean that no one can follow God's will? No. It means it's hard. It means it's difficult. What's the first step to being obedient to God's will? Surrender yourself. Surrender yourself, but even there's something even more primary but ahead of that. We have to believe his word. We have to know what his will is. I can't be, you know, how many of you have ever been in this situation? I thought you were going to stop at the store and pick up that bread. Didn't know I was supposed to. Well, you should have known that we were out of bread. And you should have stopped and got some. I didn't know. End of the story is, I'm still out of bread, right? Well, bread comes about hearing and hearing by the yeah, word. Exactly. Wise. <laughs> I've got to get it. I've got to find out. Maybe if I called and said, hey, are we out of bread? Yeah, stop and get some. I would have known to have done it. I knew the will. Communication. So who's responsible for not having bread? I didn't call. I didn't ask. God says, here's my book. It's all written down for you. Here's what I want. Here's what I desire. Here's what my will is. You should know it. You can't submit to something you don't know, but now that you know it, it's available to you, you better submit to it. Has God's will ever been done on this earth as it is in heaven? No. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's a trick question. No. In the life and death of Jesus Christ. In that instance, God's will was done perfectly on this earth. So when you say well, it's God, it was God's desire, it was God's purpose, it was his intent, it was his will. That his own son die? Yeah. That's what he tells us. He had a purpose for that, right? And that's because we didn't do God's will. Yeah. His purpose was to save us. His purpose was to reconcile us back to him. His purpose was to get us over this problem with sin. And so he sent Christ, and what did he accomplished in Christ was done precisely the way he wanted it done. You know, some have said, oh, you know, that really wasn't the original plan for Christ to come to this earth and die. But when the Jews, you know, didn't go along with it, and when they tried to stop it and all this, well, then they, God went to plan B, which was the death on the cross. Now, death on the cross was plan A. Death on the cross was always the intent. That was always his will. And so it was done, you know, consider Jesus' life. Everything that happened as you study his life in the Gospels. That was all part of God's plan. You mean it was his plan for Jesus to be tired and hungry? You know, and persecuted and thirsty and all those kinds of things? Yes. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. John 4 and 34. I can do nothing of my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
See, Jesus taught and told us, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is why these things that happened, happened. It was God's will. Garden of Gethsemane. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it's possible, be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. That should re remove any doubt about what was happening and why. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. See, we see in Christ this total submission. This is the way things were done in heaven. And so Christ is showing it to us. That we should have the same attitude, the same reaction. He knew his betrayal and his death was going to happen. and knew it was going to happen soon. When he said these things. He didn't wish to die. That was his will. But he knew he had to assume this enormous burden of our sin, of our guilt, and die for us. And so he prayed fervently not that it didn't happen. But yet he always said, it's not about me. It's not what I want. It's what you want, God. See, when we look at that and think that way, then when I look at sin over here in my life today and say, I'm going to do that. Wait a minute, that's not God's will. That's just my will. So because it's his will, I'm not going to do it. It's his will that I come to worship, so I'm going to come to worship. It's his will that I give of my means, so I'm going to give of my means. You know, it's his will that I tell others the good news of Christ, so I'm going to tell the others the good news of Christ. That's being submissive. See, God's will is the determining factor. It was the determining factor here in Christ's life and death. And it should be the determining factor in our life and death. Am I always striving to do his will first? Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does what? The will, the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, did we do all these great things in your name? And what's he going to tell us? Depart. I don't even know who you are. Why? Because you were doing your will and putting my name on it. And so if you really want to get to heaven, if you really want to enter the kingdom of heaven, then you have to do his will. I don't think that baptism stuff is necessary. I don't want to do that. I just want to do this. That's not his will. So how can I get to heaven if I didn't do his will? I don't want to obey all those things. There's too many rules and regulations. It takes all the fun out of it. I don't want to do it. That's his will. It's very important to us. If I want to get to heaven. And you notice he puts here, it does the will. Christ said, thy will be done. I can't just sit here and think about it. I can't just say, yeah, I agree with it. That's nice. I've got to actually do it. I've got to put forth the effort. There's got to be some action on my part. See, it gives us our spiritual existence. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. See, he said there's this connection between us. And it all has to do with his will. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who 
were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but the will of God. If I want to be his child, if I want to inherit his kingdom, if I want the rights and the privilege of a child in his family, then I have to do his will. Not my own will. Not the will of some other man. How many people today think they're doing God's will, but they're actually doing the will of some other man? There's buildings full of them this morning. And it's very sad. Because they really never took the time to figure out what the will of God is. And when, even if they have, they've ignored it. We, as his children, have to know it. The moment we perceive what God's will is, in any matter, anything, when we know what God's will is, you know, that perception should determine what we do. Y'all remember the little bracelets? The t-shirts? WWJD? What'd that stand for? What would Jesus do? Relevant question, right? So what would Jesus do? Any situation we're in where we're unsure, all we got to think is what would Jesus do? Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure Jesus would go into that bar and get drunk. No, we know better. We know what Jesus would do. Because he tells us. He's going to be obedient to the Father. You know, so we should conscientiously consider his will in every matter. What was his purpose? Why would God want me to act this way? Why would God allow me to be here? All these kinds of questions. How will this affect the kingdom? If I do this, am I in rebellion to God? I need to come to relevant answers to those kinds of questions. It should be the most powerful influence we have. Our rationale, our formative thinking, should be as a result of our exposure to God's will through his scripture. We know it. You know, as a knowledgeable Christian, remember we're to grow in knowledge. As a knowledgeable Christian, we acknowledge what God's will is and our responsibility to live to it. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Perfect. Discern the will of God. Know what it is. Understand it. And if you do that, then this in this lifetime, our never-ending objective for every Christian is to do God's will. And in practical terms, that means I want to grow. I want to change the way he wants me to change. I want to learn about him. I want to cease being what he doesn't want me to be. And I want to become what he wants me to be. So, leave you with this thought, 1 John 2 and 17. This world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God continues to live forever. So this morning, make sure you understand and that you're doing the will of God. I appreciate your attention this morning.